Welcome to today's webinar, Developing a Growth Mindset, Strategies for Upward Mobility, presented by Emily Douglas. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. My training would like to acknowledge that we are hosting this live webinar from the lands of the Jagera people. We also acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today and especially those joining this webinar. I'd like to introduce Emily Douglas, who is our organisational psychologist with a passion for training and delivery. Her core areas of work are leadership growth, building resilience and developing teams. She supports organisations who are willing to invest in the prevention of psychological harm in the workplace. Over the last five years, she has regularly delivered training focused on helping employees effectively manage interactive interactions with aggressive members of the public in order to build their confidence in this area. Emily facilitates in a way that engages her audience and draws on her, their experience. She thrives to minimise technical jargon and connect with those she is working with. And I'd love to invite Emily to the microphone now. Thank you, Emily. Awesome. Thanks so much, Stacey. Um, good to be here with everyone today. It's um, it's a little bit fresh where I am, even though it is Brisbane. It's um, it's August and it probably shouldn't be this cold, but hopefully everyone's nice and toasty and uh, ready to, I guess, work a little bit on your professional development in the workplace. And of course, our focus today is about the um, learning a bit more about the growth mindset and how that can help you throughout your career. So today's agenda. Um, I guess a growth mindset, the, the terminology and talking about it has become, I think, far more popular. More, more people have heard about it, which is fantastic. Um, but I want to kick us off by just getting a bit of an understanding of, of what that is and then linking that to how it can help us um, develop within the workspace. So I'm going to um, give us a bit of background there just to check that everyone's got a common understanding of what it is, because um, there are a few misconceptions there. And then we're going to delve in a little bit further and look at um, the role of resilience and your adaptability as part of that growth mindset and then looking at some goal setting how do we get feedback to aid us in achieving those goals and then looking at that ongoing uh, continuous learning that you'll have uh, in order to progress your career so the first bit looking at what we need to do broadly um, to help develop a growth mindset and so as i mentioned a bit of a, a short video um, Stacey's going to let me know if the audio doesn't come through properly, um, but hopefully it will. The term growth mindset has reached buzzword proportions and its true meaning has become distorted. Research shows that people who believe their talents can be developed through hard work, good strategies, and input from others have a growth mindset. They tend to achieve more than people with a more fixed mindset. That is, those who believe their talents are innate gifts. When companies embrace a growth mindset, their employees feel more empowered and committed. They also receive greater organizational support for collaboration and innovation. In contrast, People at primarily fixed mindset companies report more cheating and deception among employees, most likely to gain an advantage in the talent race. But people have a limited grasp of growth mindset concepts. Here are three common misconceptions. The first is the belief that you already have a growth mindset and always have. People often confuse a growth mindset with being flexible, open-minded, or with having a positive outlook. This is a false growth mindset. Everyone is a mixture of fixed and growth mindsets, and that mixture continually evolves with experience. We must acknowledge that a pure growth mindset doesn't exist to attain the benefits we seek. Another belief is that a growth mindset is just about praising and rewarding effort. But the truth is, outcomes matter. It's critical to reward not just effort, but learning and progress, and to emphasize the processes that yield these things, such as seeking help from others, trying new strategies, and capitalizing on setbacks to move forward effectively. 
outcomes follow from deeply engaging in these processes. And third, people think that just espousing a growth mindset will make good things happen. For instance, organizations often think they embody a growth mindset by creating mission statements that include lofty values like growth, empowerment, or innovation. But they mean little to employees if the company doesn't implement policies to make them real and attainable. Organizations that exhibit a growth mindset encourage appropriate risk-taking. They reward employees for useful lessons learned, even if a project does not meet its original goals. They support collaboration across organizational boundaries rather than competition among employees. They are committed to the growth of every member, not just in words, but in deeds. And they continually reinforce growth mindset values with concrete policies. But even if we correct these misconceptions, it's still not easy to attain a growth mindset, in part because we all have our own fixed mindset triggers. Facing challenges, criticism, and being compared with others can push us into insecurity or defensiveness, a response that inhibits growth. Companies that play the talent game make it tough for people to practice growth mindset thinking and behavior, like collaborating, innovating, seeking feedback, or admitting errors. To stay in a growth zone, we must identify and work with these triggers. It's hard work, but if people and organizations deepen their understanding of growth mindset concepts and the processes for putting them into practice, they'll gain a richer sense of who they are, what they stand for, and how they want to move forward. Excellent. I'm taking it because no one stopped you. That went through, the, the sound went through beautifully. Uh, and when we come to sharing materials after this presentation, um, I'll also make sure that there's a link in there for that video because it is quite sizable to send through. And um, even just watching it again, and I've watched it a couple of times, it does cover um, quite a number of concepts and it might be something that you want to share more widely in your organisation or just sort of go through and pause and look at some of those different areas. Um, but just to look at some of the key points that did come out of that, um, and there was quite a bit. Firstly, just that definition around what a growth mindset means. It's about that belief that our talents can be developed. Uh, it's not just going, oh, gosh, that child's talented. Um, they're always going to be talented, and those that aren't accepting that they can't grow or develop. It's about recognising that we can always work on things and develop our talents, and I think... Um, I don't know how many of you have been watching the Olympics at the moment, but that's really what we see in those achievements of um, all the athletes is that they've probably had some natural ability, but they also knew that it needed to be worked on to improve to get to the level that they're, are, they're at right now. Um, so, yeah, part of that development is really hard work, uh, finding the strategies that work for you and getting the involvement of others. It's not an individual pursuit. Uh, and it's not just having a positive outlook. I think this is one of the um, misnomers about a growth mindset. It probably got this um, image that it was growth mindset. It's all about that positive attitude, can do attitude, which that's great. It helps, but that's not the only thing that you need. You need to have that positive outlook, but also the um, drive and the ability to put in the effort uh, to work towards your goals. Those people with a fixed mindset and knowing that we do have a mixture of both, we're never going to be purely a growth mindset. We're always going to have those moments where we've, we've got a few fixed views that we need to just notice. Um, but those with a more fixed mindset, that that's their more predominant place that they sit, believe that the talents are innate gifts, that that's just what it is um, and you don't have that opportunity to develop. So that's what we want to move away from because um, there's a, always an a innate ability out there but we can grow and develop. Um, we don't have to sit with that um, way we are. So yeah, as I mentioned, we're a mixture of both. And part of that growth mindset and leading into having a growth mindset is rewarding the effort that people go to. So recognising um, perhaps if someone doesn't reach their goal, that they've still worked towards it, they've still maintained that effort, that they've perhaps learned something from that process um, and we like to reward outcomes, but we also want to make sure that that's the, not the only thing that gets rewarded. Quite often, um, and I've seen this in a few organisations, where the outcomes are rewarded, and sometimes those outcomes have been achieved 
just by chance um, and and the process to get there perhaps um, was a bit flawed as opposed to perhaps when someone hasn't reached the outcome but the process was sound. It was based on um, good judgment, good decision-making, good data and um, perhaps there was just a few little missteps along the way that meant the outcome wasn't achieved. So we want to make sure we look at that whole picture, the effort that people go to, what can we learn um, when it works and when it doesn't, um, and then look at the outcomes. Organisations are really key in supporting a growth mindset. Um, you know, it needs to be that environmental factors that can help people achieve. And so an organisation where collaboration is encouraged um, rather than people being pitted against each other in some sort of competitive um, structure where people have the opportunity not only to put new ideas forward, but they're rewarded. Uh, feedback's something that's encouraged rather than dreaded. Um, and people can admit errors because we learn by acknowledging our errors and um, being able to speak up about them because we stop other people making similar errors, but we also can show, okay, we tried something, it didn't work. How can we improve on it? Um, so we're going to go and dig around a little bit more in some of these um, concepts. Now, the term growth mindset, it came about from research that Carol Dweck did because uh, she was looking and um, mostly focused on school children. So this um, growth mindset scale was designed for school children in mind. That's why it's just three questions. Um, they're quite straightforward. And you've got there the, the scale that she asked people to respond to with that because she was really interested about why are some children um, succeeding at school and it's not related just to their natural aptitude because that was something we always traditionally measured was aptitude, um, that is your intelligence. Uh, and so she had a look at this growth mindset. And so she found those people that believed that you can change your intelligence. It's something you can do something about. You're capable of learning new things. Those children went on to succeed. And she, she studied this over time and she's done many studies around this. Um, and that's why the concept has now gained such momentum because of this research that Carol did. So when you hear about the growth mindset, you often see Carol Dweck's name associated with that. But I thought it'd just be interesting to see the, the questionnaire she posed there and you can probably have a think about that for yourself about okay how would I answer those questions how would I've answered those questions when I was um, of a school age would it be the same as I'm at now all right so when we're thinking about professional development um, there's a few questions we need to ask of ourselves around how we approach that uh, and throughout the presentation today, I'm going to ask a stack of reflective questions. That's because that's just how I roll as an um, organisational psychologist and professional coach. And uh, as part of the material you'll receive after this, there is a reflection workbook. So don't feel that you need to take notes on these things. Just think about it for now, absorb it in. Um, and then when you get the materials afterwards, you might want to work through that reflection sheet uh, and think a bit more deeply about these questions that I'm posing. So... Firstly, have a good think about what professional advancement means for you. It's not necessarily the same thing for everyone. Uh, when I first joined the workforce, it was very much about moving to the next tier. Um, and I think thankfully earlier on in my career, I realised that that wasn't for me um, and that was okay. But sometimes that's what organisations promote. All the people around us ask us questions about our promotions um, and we've got to recognise that perhaps that might be important for some people. They do, that's their professional advancement goal is about being promoted to the next level. Um, but for those that are not, that's still okay. You might have a different definition. Maybe it's um, becoming an expertise, uh, an expert in a particular field, you know, narrowing down your skill sets and really honing in on something. And that's um, where you see your professional advancement. And that's a big tick for yourself. So working out what that means for you and not measuring it off what other people see um, as their definition of professional advancement. So what does your success look like? Uh, and then, you know, what are the opportunities available to you to uh, achieve that professional advancement goal? So is it about staying where you are to progress um, or would you be wanting um, to move somewhere else? Now, are you looking for new opportunities for work? And then making sure if you're looking elsewhere that they align um, or if you're staying where you are, who else can you engage to get that um, opportunity to develop and grow? 
So at the end of each section, I'm just going to give a quick summary of what we went through. Um, so in order for us to grow, we need to actually set the direction, work out what professional advancement is about. Um, it's going to look different for each of us, and it's reliant on both us as individuals, but also that workplace environment that we're part of. What else is supporting us? Um, you know, if we look at the plan analogy, what's the soil? What's, um, you know, the, the water? What are those things around us that can aid in our growth? All right, so now we're going to dig in a bit further around resilience and adaptability. So resilience, um, often people will talk about resilience being the capacity to cope. Uh, and this article that I grabbed this quote from definitely had a whole piece around coping, but it's definitely more than coping. People that are resilient, they're quite flexible. They can adapt to new and different situations, learn from those experiences, they're optimistic, um, and they ask for help when they need it. So that's really key as well. So you can see how um, building our resilience really links quite strongly into what it takes to have a growth mindset and those different things that we can um, harness to help us build um, and grow our career success. So I've got a few questions here, like I said, lots of reflective questions, but this is for us to think about our resilience at work. And I've taken these from um, some of the work that Kath McEwen's done. She's an organisational psychologist down in South Australia, and she was fascinated by resilience, I think over 10 years ago, was told resilience was probably going to be a fad um, when she looked at researching it, but she went ahead anyway and, and did this research. And what I like about her research is that it doesn't just place the emphasis on the individual. It's really one of the first resilience scales to look at the individual, what it takes to be a resilient individual, but also the team environment that someone might be part of and the impact of a leader. And then she was able to determine that they're quite distinct different areas, even though there is some overlap. Uh, and she framed it within the context of work because a lot of the scales around this just look at generalised resilience or they might look at it more from your personal life. But she recognised that there was this key importance of our workplace where we spend most of our time um, that that's where we can develop and harness our resilience. And so some of the key things that she looked at or that she found were underpinned someone's overall resilience was their sense of connection to their purpose. And so that requires people being pretty clear about what it is, what's their purpose. Do they get that from their workplace? Um, because often perhaps unconsciously we seek out roles that we feel fulfill that purpose. Now, sometimes that's not always possible. Um, and if that's the case for you, you might go, okay, well, how else do I um, link in with my purpose? Perhaps if you go, right, work, work's a means to an end. It gives me the opportunity to link in with my purpose and what I do outside of work. So I guess as long as it's present somewhere. Um, so that's one part of resilience, you know, feeling that sense of purpose. Uh, Thinking about within your workplace with the team that you might be part of, are the strengths harnessed? Do we find that, that match of skill sets from people that we can um, do a little bit of job crafting even? That's where you slightly adjust, um, say, a generic duty statement so that someone can do a little bit more of those things that are their strengths because they're more likely to feel um, more connected, more purposeful and enjoy the work they do. Uh, and that works if you can then balance out perhaps something that isn't their strength, but another team member might pick that up. So it's about that, you know, how do we enable people to work towards their strengths in the workplace? So that's something to think about as well. Um, what do people at work and yourself included do in the face of challenges? Um, you know, what are the types of questions that are asked when a challenge presents? Is it just purely solution focused? Um, or do people have a look at um, nitpicking what the problem is. And I've, again, seen this, and perhaps you have as well, that people will focus on the problem, why did it happen, why did things go wrong, rather than asking questions about how do we fix this now? Let's accept that it's happened. We might come back and revisit why it's happened, but our real focus is what's the solution that we can work towards? How can we improve on this? Um, is work-life balance supported? We aren't separate individuals at work um, and then at home. 
there needs to be this balance because we will bring um, the positive energy from home into work. Likewise, we'll maybe if we've got negative um, work environment, we'll take that home or vice versa. So we need to have that balance across it and um, great that that's supported. And we're definitely noticing there's more of a trend and the research is telling us this, that there's more of a trend towards flexible work arrangements being embraced. Um, there's still a bit of a way to go. It's one thing to say people um, can have flexible work arrangements. It's quite different in terms of how they are implemented and implemented effectively, but we're getting there. Um, is building capability encouraged? And so this is, you know, does your workplace encourage people to go and develop their skills, um, you know, attend professional development events like this, but perhaps even more in-depth ones, um, you know, pursue a particular interest so that that um, will build up a capability. And, and we're going to do a little bit of um, talking around professional development as well. Um, but that's one area um, that can help build resilience when people, again, can do something that they enjoy um, and build a skill set. And um, support within the workplace is really important. Are team members where you work supporting one another, acknowledging achievements? And that doesn't need to be, um, you know, a certificate or a medal. It can be just that, hey, great work yesterday, really liked the way you ran that meeting or, you know, that report was really succinct. It really helped make a decision. You know, it can just be those small things that show someone that their work is noticed, their effort is noticed, um, because too often people are only noticed when they do the wrong thing. We need to make sure that we recognise when someone does something well. Uh, and the final piece about resilience in the workplace is around the alignment of effort. Now, is everyone working towards a common goal? Because um, it's great that people can develop and achieve on their individual pursuits, but we also want to make sure that that's all heading in the same direction because then we're all going to connect and support each other if all our efforts are aligned and we can balance out the needs of the team versus our individual needs. And we, and we definitely always need that balance between the two. So a few more sort of reflective questions as well around whether your workplace um, is encouraging and helping build resilience. Um, you know, just thinking about a new ideas encouraged, how does that come about? Um, you know, what happens when someone presents a new idea? Is it explored further? Um, is it told, you know, is that person told no, it won't be looked at? You know, how is that um, supported in the workplace? And, and I guess that aligns as well about that culture of learning from mistakes. So going, okay, that didn't go as planned. Um, what did we miss? Because there might be some little gems in there where you're like, well, this worked really well. Um, but for some reason, you know, it should have worked and it didn't go as we as we planned, what else was happening in there? Um, and sometimes it can be some minor tweaks that we can learn from um, and encourage. And it's about asking those questions in a more positive way rather than in a critical way where you're trying to, um, you know, do the, why did this happen? It's more about, okay, so um, what went wrong? What can we learn from? So that learning from mistakes rather than being too critical. And the last bit might seem that it's a more individual, but um, thinking about your inner voice, because often we'll take on um, the voice of perhaps our supervisor where we'll think about what are the questions they're going to ask or how are they going to view my work? Um, and so we just got to think about what's that inner voice telling us as well? Is it is it letting us know that it's safe to try new things and, and have a challenge or are we more fearful of failure or the attitude of failure. So thinking about tuning into what does that sound like? Um, often, yeah, it comes from those around us that we, we start to reflect a little bit of what they're saying to us and it becomes our, our inner voice as well. Another part, um, sort of a part of resilience, but it's got a bit of an overlap uh, as a separate entity is thinking about adaptability. Uh, and this, again, a bit of reflection on ourselves. How well do we um, react when there's change? Because there's always change. Um, you know, that's why there's specialists in change management. Thinking, what is our reaction when we hear that a change is going to occur? Do we, do we tense up? Do we get worried about it? Um, do we start to catastrophize what's going on? Or do we go, okay, let, let's wait and see what's going to happen here. Now, what's, what's our level of reaction when we hear about a change? Um, how comfortable are we trying new things? And this can be thinking about everything from 
uh, trying out a new process at work to trying a new food when we're out. Um, what's our level of comfort of trying mm. new things and in what domains do we see that perhaps some areas we're really comfortable um, challenging ourselves and trying new things? What are the areas that we're not so comfortable and how do we build up that level of comfort? Now, it's always the, a little bit of exposure. So, you know, we can try with something small of trying to get ourselves doing something we're a little uncomfortable with because the more we do it, the more comfortable we're going to become. So just taking notice of where does your discomfort sit um, and uh, is there a benefit of you trying to get more comfortable with something that you're normally uncomfortable with um, because from that we can grow. Part of our adaptability is whether or not we seek out feedback um, because that's us then going, right, I'm willing to learn. I, I want to engage with those that can give me advice and support me through this. So I'm going to go and seek out feedback. Um, that helps us adapt because it might show us new ways of doing things that we hadn't thought of before. Um, and the final one there is about whether or not we admit if we make errors. Now, how comfortable are we? What standards do we hold ourselves to? Because sometimes we might have our own standards, you know, oh, people view me a certain way, therefore I can never admit to making a mistake. Um, whereas other people are actually quite comfortable coming forward and going, yeah, look, I didn't quite get this right. How can someone help? So just, again, thinking about yourself, how comfortable are you admitting making errors? Um, and there's good research from Brene Brown around this of um, being a little bit vulnerable because if we admit to others that perhaps we haven't always got it right, um, then that makes them feel like it's a safer space for them to admit to errors. And then there's the opportunity to learn. So if we hide errors, um, we, might, we might be able to correct them without anyone noticing, um, but we probably got, would have got to a better solution or got there quicker if we'd engaged others. And they would have also had the benefit of learning of what we did. So just thinking about do you admit with errors, admit to making errors, um, and do you show a little bit of vulnerability, particularly if you're sitting in a leadership role? It's actually a good thing to show people that you don't always get it right, um, that you can learn from one another. You can definitely learn from people that work for you. Uh, and, and then it makes them more willing to speak up sooner, get advice and support before those errors become um, too significant. Now, I posed a lot of questions got you to think about some areas for improvement when it comes to then how do we go about doing that i like to think of this circles of control circles of concern which comes from stephen covey um, and just thinking about what are those things that we can change that are within our control um, which often isn't too many things and then we've got to think about how do we influence and this is really important because we're thinking about work we're thinking about team environments uh, so it's about how do we influence those around us? How do we set up that environment um, to make it as positive as possible to uh, support a growth mindset? So it's all those sorts of things around admitting to errors, um, collaborating, letting people do tasks that lean into their strengths. There's all these areas that we can influence. And then we also have to accept those things that sit outside of that that are maybe concerns for us, but we can't actually control nor can we influence. So we just have to accept that's fixed. It might be that there's a particular policy, maybe there's a law that regulates how we do things. Um, maybe it's just a senior leadership member that we just know that they're quite stuck in their ways. And so we've just got to put that aside and go, right, well, I can't do anything with that. I'm not going to waste my energy there, but I'm going to focus more on those areas that I can influence so I can support that growth mindset for those around me that is in turn going to help create um, a more positive environment for myself. All right, so resilience, it requires a growth mindset for us to lean into that. Um, and it's very much influenced by the people around us. It's certainly not an individual pursuit. There's things that we can do as an individual, but we also rely on those people around us. Uh, so those social supports are really key in terms of sustaining that. Resilience is not just fixed. It's not like, right, I'm a resilient person. It's something we always work on. Um, we can always grow and develop. So it's about sustaining our level of resilience. Uh, and we need to focus our energy on those things that we can either control or influence um, and recognise when our energy is being sapped by things that concern us but we cannot change. All right, so 
talked about identifying areas where you can grow. So it's important then that we look about setting some achievable goals for ourselves um, and seeking some constructive feedback on the way. Um, and I actually liked finding this little graphic because it shows we, we put all this effort going forward. Sometimes there's going to be a bit of a setback, but that is something that can help us learn and push us forward again. Now, I'm not going to go through and talk about SMART goal setting. Um, I expect that many people on this webinar have heard of SMART goals, they know what it's all about, and have probably written a few from time to time. So what I want to focus on is how do we enhance that SMART goal setting? How do we um, make sure that we are actually putting down the right goals um, and breaking them down into something that's realistic and, and achievable? Um, because the SMART goal setting is great, um, but you also need to think about when you set those goals, why do you want to achieve this goal? Why is it important? Um, is it something that someone else has set? In which case, if we're not as invested as they are, then we're probably less likely to get there or it's going to be a harder road because we're not intrinsically um, motivated to achieve that. So it's good just to think about the reasons why you want to achieve that goal um, and your level of motivation. Because the more intrinsic it is, the more likely we are going to keep on pushing in the face of setbacks. Whereas if it's more of an external goal that someone else has set for us or we just go, look, I've just got to do it as part of my job, um, then that might be a reason just to notice why we aren't getting there even though we set the time aside and we put things in place. And so just being aware of it, you might still need to go through and achieve that goal, but it's just like, why is this harder? Um, so it's that intrinsic versus extrinsic goal setting. Um, and so part of that motivation as well is thinking about the consequence for not achieving it because that can be a motivator as well of what we're trying to move away from. Um, you know, is the consequence of not achieving that goal, does that um, equate to a problem for you in your career, your career progression? So just being aware of what that consequence is and maybe you put that down with the goal of going, if I don't do this by this date, Here's, here's the problem that it causes for me. Um, and definitely thinking again about your social support, your social networks. Who else can you involve? People want to help each other. So, um, and sometimes it might be just you need to talk through a problem with someone um, or maybe they've, they've got a real active involvement in achieving that goal. Maybe they, you know, you're waiting on them to do something before you can progress your goal to the next step. So just identifying who those people are that can support you um, or that need to be involved in, in understanding your goals and how they fit in. So, yeah, constructive feedback is a big part of that goal achievement. So I love this little quote here from um, Will. One of the most powerful things an organisation can do is creating a culture where giving and receiving feedback becomes the norm. But that means both kinds of feedback because while praise is affirmation, criticism is an investment. Uh, and yet too many people view criticism as a negative experience. I mean, that's because sometimes it can be. But if we go into getting feedback of going, all right, what can I learn? Um, you know, what, what am I going to gain that's going to help me further down the track? Um, then we're going to be more engaged even the receiving of that feedback. Uh, often people giving feedback, particularly when it's negative, they're often nervous themselves and so the words don't come out quite right and it becomes this really clunky, awkward process. And so being able to, um, you know, if you're going to take on positive feedback, you need to be willing to have the flip side of the coin um, where there is some criticism or some faults that can be worked on. So in terms of giving and receiving feedback, um, over my time working, I've seen various um, frameworks come and go about how feedback should be delivered. And it used to be um, you give a positive, then you give them the negative, and then you give them the positive again so that they've, you know, you've got that positive to go on. Um, however, this is the model that I'm um, definitely more keen on these days is that you talk about what someone's done well. So there could be certain aspects of a task that they've done well. Then you talk about what they could have done better and then how? Um, because often it's that missing piece of explaining, you know, how it could have been better because it also makes sure that the feedback is grounded in some realism. You know, it's not these lofty goals of, of going, right, you did this well, this wasn't so great, and just leaving it there. Um, because also then the person, if you're the person 
giving that feedback, it means that you've got to think more critically and go, well, you know, how, how could they have done this better? And he said they're actually realistic given the time constraints they had or the resource constraints they had. So it means that that feedback is more grounded um, and there is that opportunity for the person receiving it to take that on. Um, now, this might already happen in your organisation or some version of that, um, but I like the simplicity of thinking good, better, how. And so that could be something that you go, right, how do I, how does this fit with the way that we currently do feedback? Is it a version of this um, or is that a new way to change things up? Or if we're thinking about that influence piece, um, maybe if you're receiving, due to receive feedback or requesting feedback um, from someone, asking them, okay, what, what do you see that worked? What was good about what I've just done? How could I do that better? And so that's just a good way to frame it up um, and ask them for that feedback and start to influence how they provide it. And they might notice those differences as you take on board what they're saying. One of the reasons that that feedback cycle is challenging is because it brings about emotions in people. You know, there's this emotional reaction, whether it's positive feedback or negative feedback, um, we do have an emotional response. And so those emotions signal to us what matters, that we care about our performance, that we, um, you know, have worked our hardest to do something. And so having emotions show us that what we were doing mattered. Um, and so we need to learn to check in when we're having an emotional response and go, Phew, gosh, I did have a response and, and maybe you weren't expecting it. I'm just going, okay, um, let me check in with that and, and work out what was it that I was responding to? Yeah, was it that I was exhausted because I stayed up all night with that report and I'm actually a little bit frazzled anyway? Um, or was it, you know, I really cared about the outcomes of what I was doing. That was really important to me and that's why it did make me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe I got a little bit teary um, or perhaps you got um, felt some of the, that anger pent up because you go, well, I did put a lot, lot of effort in and that effort hasn't been noticed. So just check in with the, those emotional responses so you can think about um, why you're having that reaction, why it's impacting you. Um, and something we don't often do when receiving feedback is um, we try and bottle up those emotions, right? We don't want to necessarily have them in the room with the person that we're speaking with. Um, and so we try and hold on tight. What we do need to do is allow a bit of time for reflection on those emotions, letting them kind of just settle. Um, and sometimes this means that once we've had a time to pause and reflect, that in terms of that growth, enabling ourselves to grow and develop, we, we, when we're settled, we can go back and seek out further clarification, ask questions that we just didn't feel that we could do when we're in a heightened emotional state. Uh, and so think about that when you're planning on delivering feedback to someone as well, giving them the opportunity to have some reflection, um, let those emotions settle, and then open up that door for them to go, right, come back and ask me some more questions. Because inevitably that's going to help the whole team grow um, when there's a chance to provide feedback on an ongoing basis um, that people can have the chance to sit, take on board the feedback, reflect on it, ask questions, um, and I guess take advantage of what they're being provided because that feedback should be a gift for growth. So a few key learnings here. We want to set achievable goals that engage you, that are important to you. Uh, we want to seek out and provide constructive feedback uh, and learn how to harness our emotions rather than hide from them. All right, now last part here, looking at leveraging continuous learning to help progress our career. So continuous learning, it comes in so many forms. There's so many different things out there. There's so many different platforms that are offering us learning opportunities. Um, so it's always good to sit down and go, right, what are the sources of learning from within your professional space? Because you might have very specific um, professional learning goals that you need to achieve or things that you need to keep up with. And so closely looking at those within your profession. Um, but then also looking outside of your profession. What are other sources of learning are there out there that might interest you, that might give you something that's useful, that links back into your profession? Or maybe it's linked to um, changing professions as well. Uh, but looking outside of your network and 
um, exploring other avenues. Also thinking about where you can learn away from work. Um, and sometimes that can also be making sure that there is time out to reflect and pause and think about where you're at. Um, but there can be different ways that you can, can learn about um, what inspires you, what interests you. And then how often are you reviewing your alignment between your career progression and your learning? Um, is it just something that happens annually because that's a requirement at work to set down goals and where you're heading to next? Does it rarely happen? Um, because there isn't a framework in your workplace. Um, and regardless of what the work sets up, thinking about yourself, having a different range of goals. So you might initially go, right, in five years' time, this is where I would like to be. That's where I see my career progression. How do my learning goals set up across that five-year time frame? Then bringing it down to perhaps what you need to do in the next 12 months, but then also breaking that 12-month period up into quarters. And it's about being reasonable with yourself about what you can achieve over that time period um, and and then aligning that in with some of the goals that you set because some people um, are always seeking out new ways of learning for others it might be that it's it's done with some reluctance because um, that's just not one of your priorities but you might need to focus on it in order to progress your career you might need certain qualifications to get to where you're wanting to head um, and the only way to do that is to break it down into some nice chunks that you can see some progress with. So when we're thinking about learning for growth, we want to check in with ourselves. Are we seeking out learning opportunities that challenge us? Or are we seeking out those ones that are easy, that make us feel good? Because we go, yep, succeeded at that, got that done. Um, and so you might want to just check. You, you're seeking reasonable challenges with your learning. Um, do you seek to understand different viewpoints? Do you... You know, look at a wide range of sources because um, it's important to go, oh, this is uncomfortable, this is different to how I would think. That's great because it helps us learn. We can understand then different viewpoints um, and see a problem from different angles. Look at your organisation. Does it support new ideas? Does it support people taking on different viewpoints, learning through different streams? Um, and then thinking about how often do you reflect on what you learn? Often we'll set aside time for a course. Maybe it's that you've set aside the, the hour block for something like this webinar. But it's also important to set aside some time to then just reflect on what you've learned and how that applies to your role. Um, and it's that next little bit that really starts to consolidate learning, um, that reflective piece. So please, when you get all the materials, just give yourself you know, 15, 20 minutes to sit down there and, and reflect on some of these concepts. All right, key learnings here, seeking lots of learning opportunities from a wide range of resources. Don't limit yourself. Um, get support from your workplace, whether that's in the form of just time um, or it might be actual financial. And then definitely reflect, take that time to reflect on your learnings. All right, so that is our webinar on uh, growth mindsets for career progression. Uh, if there's any questions, or I'll hand back to Stacey, actually, to see if we've got any questions that are coming through from this one. Thank you so much, Emily. So many great points. And it's one of those webinars where the supplementary material is going to be really important because I think it's something to revisit over and over again and to keep front of mind those career goals and to keep reflecting and recessing. So we will be sending everyone out a link to the recording today, as well as the PowerPoints and a lovely um, sheet for you to reflect on those questions that Emily has posed today. So it is question time. And Emily, thank you for so being beautifully timed. It's perfect for our 15 minutes of questions. If it you... doesn't always doesn't always happen, but it was not work today. I think you're pretty good. <laughs> um, for those of you that are on, we do have quite a number of people on today. You can just drop down your questions in the Q&A section and Emily will um, do her best to answer those for you. So feel free to choose any of the sections that you found really interesting and I'll direct them to Emily on your behalf. Uh, I always keep the questions off because people aren't quick enough to get in <laughs> before I'm ready to go and I have some questions myself. <laughs> I absolutely loved the video you shared at the beginning, Emily, and I think it's really important to say that we don't have a pure growth mindset. And I think we can 
kind of assume that that's the sort of state that we want to get to. But it's just not the case. We, we're human beings and we can't always be in that state. I suppose my question for you is around what to do when we find ourselves or in that fixed mindset, you know, when we notice or when we're kind of going down a path, how can we sort of switch back into that growth mindset? Yeah, look, and I think even noticing is fantastic because often we get too stuck going down those paths and we we don't notice that you're starting to get some of those rigid thinking traps coming in of I can't do anything, this is me, this is this is absolutes. Um, it's always good to have someone trusted in your corner that you can have these conversations with and, and they can challenge you a little bit where you can just go, oh, yeah, I can't, you know, I can't do anything. This is all, you know, all I'm capable of achieving and that they will go, oh, okay, you yeah. know, tell me about that. What's the evidence for it? So it's it's really having those people that you're comfortable sort of sharing a little bit with and that they can um, just gently challenge you. Yeah. And, and it's good to have a mix of workplace, people that do that for you, but also, um, you know, some friends or family members that you, you're you okay doing that with it will pull you up when you're getting a bit too fixed in the way that you're thinking. Mm, that's great. So looking out for the language that we're using, the thoughts that we're telling ourselves and perhaps even giving our colleagues or our friends a heads up if I start saying things like this. <laughs> and, and look, I think to be fair, I mean, this research is all coming out now and it's starting to shape our education system and, and how we pose questions and how we frame things to children because if you've worked somewhere that very much has a more fixed mindset attitude yeah. then that's that's that that's that's that inner voice that you're going to have yeah. um, and so we can't expect everyone in our workplace even though the workplace might be super supportive is that you're going to think where have individuals come from that they've learned that they can you know I, new ideas aren't encouraged or that you know this is your fixed capacity that you're only ever going to be um you know a certain level of intelligence or a certain tier within the organization where have those beliefs come from because it could be that that's the environment that they've they progressed their career so far through um, and so it could take a while for those habits to shift and change mm. uh, which is why it's important that they start to be developed in the next generation and that's i think where um Harold Works research is definitely um you know, making a difference. Same with um, Angela Duckworth's research, which links in as well. It's about passion and perseverance leading to success. Um, yeah, we we need to sort of, I guess, be easy on ourselves of going. Well, that was that was the way I was conditioned. Um, think in a more fixed manner. Oh, absolutely. If you were raised in the eighties and the nineties, most likely. <laughs> yeah. 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 Era. Um, I've read Angela Duckworth's book twice. It is fantastic for anyone out there. Um, it's a bestseller. So if you get your hands on that, it's a really great kind of resource that you might want to read that does sort of align to this topic today. And I love that you just raised that schools are changing because that's the takeaway I kind of had as well. When you talked about rewarding effort and learning from an organizational perspective, I can absolutely see that happening in my children's school um just in the awards that they give out sure they still have the academic achievement award but they have another award which recognizes effort because literally over that semester another child might have worked harder to kind of improve their grades and to grow and this is webinars are all about growth versus that child that you know didn't do much and rested on their laurels because they're they are you know gifted in in some way so it's really fascinating to see the shift in schools and let's hope that organizations start to mirror that as well. You know, that giving feedback to reward um, effort. I really loved that point and that was just huge for me. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no. And yeah, I think it is schools are doing it, which is great. But then if the people finish up a school and then go to an organization that hasn't progressed in that same way, um, then it's hard for them to yeah, carry on with that growth mindset. So it is this whole environment, individual interaction um, which is why I made that slide there about the influence because just because you've come into an environment where they don't yet encourage yeah, the effort, um, then you've got a chance to influence that as well and not just accept the way that is. I'm going, right, I'm sure there's you know, like-minded teammates that we can get on board and we can start to, to change things from the inside out potentially. 
I love that you just used the growth mindset language, <laughs> that the organization is not yet there. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was brilliant. Um, and just another encouragement for our lovely audience to please write down your questions if you've got any, um, and I'll direct them to Emily. I've got one more, so I'll give everyone our, um, in our audience time to do that. And it does actually relate to influencing the culture around this growth mindset. And I think that's where the rubber hits the road and where it can be quite tricky. Because as you said, there's different operators, different perspectives. Um, a real light bulb moment for me was when you talked about, you know, that there are risk takers in organisations, people that do come up with ideas, but then you might be opposed by others who are more conservative and are problem focused. You know, how can we start to nudge <laughs> to our teams, our leaders, our colleagues in that way? And I, I know this is a really tricky question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess you do need your people that are there to identify risks. Um, True. Good. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and, yeah, that's really key and you, you need your new ideas. And so it's just being intentional and understanding, right, I balanced up both those concerns, you know, the, the great ideas that are a little bit riskier versus what is the risk of, of doing things a certain way. Mm -hmm. And then you can note that decision was made with a balance of those things in mind. Um and, and I think that is something that most organisations have to do as a process anyway of noting down that balance that they've made in a decision as opposed to just going, yep, that's... And sometimes it does come to a bit of a gut feel and that's why they're then noting, being a bit more intentional, going, okay, why did I jump to that? Yep, I've, I've balanced that out. The risk, whilst it's there, the consequence isn't too significant so we can take that chance with it. Um, I guess it's data gathering where you can. Um, whether that's available to help inform your decisions, but then being intentional about it and going, yep, I've made it based on these balance. Um, and, and that's, I guess, part of that company culture because some some companies are really risk adverse and they need to be, that's their culture. Yeah, Others are, you know, those more innovative um, market disruptor type of companies. So they want more of that encouraging new ways of thinking. Um, there's always that balance. So it's, it's a trade-off. Um, it's just being noticing what that trade is that you're making. Oh, I love that answer. That was excellent. So just, you know, it was that collegiality that you talked about, you know, getting different people on board, getting different perspectives to come up with a solution where everyone's had an import from different perspectives and that cross department or cross teams um, communication or input as well. I think um, we can all kind of get in our silos from time to time and get so busy and um, pin down and what we're focusing on, but actually reaching out and making sure you do have that different perspective from different areas or departmental areas can, um, I suppose, improve the decision that you're making. So, yeah, and I guess I want to add on to that as well now that you've nicely summed it up is that um, it's great to yeah, gather in all those different opinions, but it's also then acknowledging that you've, you've listened. Yes. Because um, people can get a bit disillusioned if they offer their opinion and go, well, they went in a different direction. But if they have that acknowledgement, I considered that and that that did help you know, tone down the decision or, you know, head me in a slightly different direction, I still listen to that piece of advice. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, if people go, oh, well, I've offered that and they just keep on, um, you know, ignoring it or it feels like it's been ignored, mm -hmm. then they'll stop offering that counter opinion, which had, there's numerous examples where that has then led to problems as well for, for businesses. Oh, that's a great tip as well. And sort of being, I suppose, transparent about what factors of the decision was made upon because there's always different factors that you need to weigh mm. up when making yeah. a decision, you know, costs versus time, for example, is really basic. You know, you might need to implement something immediately. So whatever that other person suggested, you know, might not have been viable this time, but maybe that's a longer term solution. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, wonderful. Um your point about feedback was excellent and I just want to point out to our listeners that our next webinar is actually on um, sort of doing more of a deep dive into giving and receiving that feedback. One and I think it's really important that we do sort of delve more deeply into this topic and particularly around giving feedback to our supervisors, which can be really challenging and tricky um, given, you know, sometimes our power imbalance sort of sits there. But it will be also focused on giving um, feedback more generally as well and growing that feedback culture, which Emily alluded to. Um, and I love the model that you put up, Emily, that I haven't seen that one before. It's excellent. And it kind of challenges the person who's giving feedback to do it in a direct way rather than a kind of a roundabout way. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. No, I love that that's the next webinar is the one on feedback. I'm like, oh, 
That's perfect. I can't wait to listen into that one. Oh, thank you so much. And now that we haven't received any more questions, I hope um, our audience has enjoyed that sort of Q&A section between Emily and I. I'd like to wrap up today's webinar and I'm going to let you know what's going to happen next. Um, as a person who has attended today, we've got your details. So we'll send you a statement of attendance, which you can use for your professional development and evidence that you were here today. Uh, you're also going to receive access to the webinar recording and a reflection sheet that Emily mentioned. I highly encourage you to take the time out of your work to go through that sheet and then to continue reviewing the resources that we send you so that you stay on track with your career goals. Uh, just checking the Q&A as there are no further questions, I will now conclude today's webinar. On behalf of Emily, I would like to thank my training for presenting today's session and would like to thank you for being live today. I do have an offer for our audience, which is a little unusual. Um, I don't normally do this at the end. Uh, I didn't go into the usual spiel about my training at the beginning, um, but I want to just let you know that in addition to the leadership and management qualifications that we deliver, we are also the largest deliverer of mental health first aid training, public training across Australia. We now have 20 venues and we also do corporate delivery if you have six or more people that can attend that training. And the offer, oh, and the other thing we do as well is neuro, neurodiversity at work, um, corporate training. Um, the offer I have for you today is a 10% discount off our mental health first aid training with the code webinar 10. So if you want to pop that code into your cart when you're purchasing that training, it's really reasonably priced training. It's two days public training. And Emily is our facilitator for Brisbane and she does a fantastic job. So we would love to see you come along. Our August session is already booked out, but we absolutely have spots for September. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. Our next webinar Feedback strategies, how to give and receive feedback upwardly. It's going to be held on the 19th of September at 12 p.m. All the details can be found on our website, along with that mental health first aid training that I talked about. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you, Emily, and bye for now.